Good afternoon. How's everybody doing? Are you enjoying you enjoying school? Yeah. Yeah? Do you want to stay in school? Yeah. For how long? Till college. College. Who's not planning on going to college? Excellent. 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 It took me a while to get to college. It took a while. But you know, as I believe is that if you have a passion, if you have a vision, then all things are possible. How many of you know what hope is? What is hope? Hope is what helps you accomplish things. Uh-huh. Okay. So do you have hope? Yeah. Yeah? What kind of hope do you have? See, it's a hard one to define, isn't it? So let's think of it this way, okay? I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you something to think of it uh, in, in a more common sense way. Hope is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Okay? Hope is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. And when you think it in those terms, that means there's always a way. There's always a means. There's always a method. There's always a way that we can achieve and propel ourselves forward, right? So I believe in this statement. Think about this statement. If we change the way we look at things, the things that we look at will change. So it's how we think about things that makes a difference. So then we should use our words to change our situation and not to describe it. And what I mean by that is if we walk around life, if I walk around life all my life, and I'll tell you a little bit about myself, a little bit more. If I walked around all, all around life complaining and concerned about woe was me and how people picked on me and how I was down and out and I was just a poor orphan kid from an orphanage, then that's where I would stay. My life wouldn't change. But I had to start seeing things that were beyond that. I had to take what I thought was negative and turn it and twist it into a positive that, you know what, this was a good thing. So I kind of led into my story. I was given up for adoption when I was eight days old, born in Grand Junction, taken to a state orphanage. And in that state orphanage, I lived there till I was five years old. So I remember things about the orphanage when I was five years old. It's not as crystal clear as it would be like yesterday. But I had these film clips about myself about things that happened and what occurred inside that orphanage. And I learned some valuable lessons in that orphanage. One of the things I learned, can I write on here? You can write on this one, sir. Okay. I like green. You guys like green? Yeah. hope it works. It looks a little smushed up. <laughs> <laughs> but green is the color of hope in Spain. Did you know that? So I always write with green. I write with green ink. All my documents, even when I was mayor, everything I signed was in green ink. So green reminds me that I've got hope. And it reminds me of my culture, of who I am and where I came from. So what I learned in the orphanage is that there's three important valuable lessons. These are some values that I learned. And one was to accept is to accept people for who they are, no matter where they come from, no matter who they are, no matter what's wrong with them. It doesn't matter. It's acceptance. Okay? And the other one is that, is to share everything that I have in life. Share my knowledge, share my things, share my car, share my food. Share everything that I have. Because I believe in the law of giving. See, so if you give, then it comes back. If you share, then you must care. Sharing shows that you care. And that's all. When you think about leadership in this big picture of things, these are quality traits that a good leader has, is that they have a sense of care. They have a sense of acceptance, right? And the other thing is, this is going to be a big word. Tell me if you know what it is. Do not stereotype. What is that? What's stereotyping? 
Kind of a big word, isn't it? Throws you out there. Stereotyping is, and I'm going to convey a story. When I was a little kid in the orphanage, they used to take us on the bus. And they would load us up on this bus, and I never knew what it said, but now I do. It said State Orphanage, you know, for Denver. And uh, they'd take us to another park in a playground somewhere. And in that playground, I remember getting off the bus, and I saw all these other adults, which now I later identify as parents, taking their kids away from these playstations and they were holding them back. So I thought, well, it's our turn. That's, we learned to do that in the orphanage. We learned to share, take turns, right? Nothing, we didn't own anything in the orphanage. You didn't have a closet. You didn't have your own foot locker. You didn't uh, have your own bicycle or anything like that. Everything was shared. Every time I went outside to play, especially it was cold outside, they'd bring out this big table of coats, lay them out there, and every day we had a different coat. We never had the same coat which was okay, we never knew the difference. No one told us that was wrong or that was bad. We accepted it, right? So that was an important piece for us. So we went to this park and these kids were all taken off the station and PlayStations, and then when I started, I was trying to get on one of those PlayStations, I could hear this conversation behind me and I heard these adults talking. And these adults were talking about us and I don't remember exactly what they said, but I remember this. The kids were saying, why can't we play with them? Why can't we go over there? And I remember these adults telling their kids, you can't play with them. Those are orphans. And I never knew what an orphan was. How many of you know what an orphan is? Yeah, you know what an orphan is, right? They said, those are orphans. And as a kid, I didn't know what that word meant. I just knew it must be bad. How many of you think orphans are bad? Are they bad people? No, you know that, but they didn't back then, didn't understand that. And I thought, well, there's something wrong with me because I'm an orphan. I didn't know what the word meant, but it sounded very bad because of their voice inflection. So I was really concerned. And all I could think about was getting back on the bus and going back to the orphanage, and I never wanted to leave that place again. So that's a stereotyping. Do we do stereotyping today? Do we kind of finger point at people? Oh, they live in this rich neighborhood. Or these people, you know, this is the way they dress. Or they go on a lot of vacations. They're wealthy people. So we start stereotyping by maybe their class and the way they live. Or maybe it's our culture. Maybe it's because I'm Latino that people stereotype. Now, some people stereotype that as being good and others take a whole different picture. So that's what I mean by stereotyping. So it's something that I, I learned. I thought this is something I never want to do, stereotype. I always want to share with people. And I always want to accept people for who they are. And that's been an important value for me growing up as a kid in the orphanage. And then finally, I was adopted. And when I was adopted, my parents, they took me to my first house I ever lived at, 604 Sycamore Street in Fort Collins. Small house, but to me it looked like a mansion. I never seen nothing like it. I had my own bedroom. I had my own closet. I had my own clothes. I mean, this was life. And I just didn't quite get it. Didn't quite understand. You see, because when I was in the orphanage, they used to allow parents to take us out like a library book. They could check us out for two weeks, and I'd go home with these parents to see if they liked me or not. And if they didn't, they could return me. So I could always remember going with them and everybody making over me and trying to be happy and everything. And then coming back, I wasn't sitting in the front seat of the car. I was sitting in the back seat of the car, and nobody was talking to me. So I knew they didn't like me. They didn't accept me. And I got out of the orphanage, got out of the car, and I ran inside and I used to tell myself, I never want to leave this place again. They say, I can't, I can't accept that. You see, that gave me a, a loss of hope. And then when my parents actually adopted me, it seemed like there was an instant attachment. It seemed like we just, like, I wanted to go, they wanted me, and we were all in agreement, right? That's, that's good. That's a good thing, right? 
And off we went. And they took me. Stuck a stocking cap on my head, gave me a toy, little toy dog, and put it under my arm, and off we went. Came to Fort Collins, where I grew up. And that's why I feel like I owe this community a lot. Because this community, as a community, helped raise me. Growing up in downtown Fort Collins, and in this part of town, in fact, Putnam Elementary School was my school. And I was in fifth grade. This is fifth grade, right? When I was in fifth grade, I won my first political office. I was Secretary of Student Council. How do you like that, huh? My first political office, right here at Putnam Elementary School. Fifth grade class was on the other side of this whole building is set up. But that, I was the secretary. Miss Canfield was the president, the uh, principal. And she told me, Ray, you need to be on student council. And I looked and I said, I do? And she said, yeah, I think you'd be great. And so I was elected. And there I was reading the minutes to all of our meetings, going to all the classrooms, getting to know all the students. Right? Isn't that what leaders want to do? They want to be known. They want people to know who they are. But then that calls for a big order, which means I got to hold true to my character. I got to behave right. I got to set the pace, set the representation of what, how we should behave, right? That's all part of leadership. It's all part of, it's ingrained in us. And when I started growing up in, in Fort Collins, I was probably about 10, 11 years old, and it was around 1962 or so. And I used to be a shoe shine boy in downtown Fort Collins. I used to shine everybody's shoes. And I got promoted to shining shoes inside instead of outside. And I remember talking to some of the guys there, and I remember them saying, you know, hey, look, here comes the mayor. He says, it's your turn to shine his shoes. And we're all talking. You know, this is us kids talking, right? And we said, what's mayor? And he says, oh, he owns everything in town. The mayor buys everything. <laughs> well, I found out later that's not true, you know. But... So here comes the mayor, he comes in and he gets up on the chair and I shine his shoes and he takes a liking to me. So he comes in every week and he waits for me. He doesn't go with anyone else. He just waits for me and I shine his shoes every time. And I used to tell myself when I shined his shoes, I said, one of these days, I'm going to wear those shoes. One of these days, I'm going to be the mayor. That's what I said. That gave me a hope. And then all of a sudden I had a passion for what I wanted to do. You see, if you don't have a hope, and if you don't have passion, it doesn't matter how far you go in school, how are you gonna achieve? So having a passion and a desire, how many of you have a passion for something you wanna do when you grow up? Any ideas? Yeah? Let's hear it, what is it? Um, I wanna be a veterinarian. Veterinarian, good for you. Doctor. Wow. Basketball player. Pro? Yeah? Officer. Police officer? I used to be one. You? Basketball player. Basketball player. Yeah. Um, an NBA basketball player. Wow, a lot of basketball stars here. A doctor? A, doctor? a lot of doctors. Doctor. Wow, did you say? I wasn't even thinking that way at your age. I wasn't thinking that. But I did have this passion after being a shoeshine boy. I said, this is what I want to be. I want, I'm going to, I want to be the mayor. But then I also had another dream. And I had another vision. And that was to be a police officer. I felt like I could really help. I could do, be part of this community by being a policeman that could help people. And I really believed in that. And I did. And I held on to that dream. See, there's an old saying, you should chase your dreams. I say, you should never chase your dreams, okay? But you should live your dreams. If you chase your dreams, you'll never catch them, right? It's always out here, you can't catch it, right? But if you live your dreams, then you want to be a police officer, start acting like one. In a, in a behavioral mode, your good character, your honesty, your integrity, those are things you can't purchase. That's one thing about leadership that people look for. Are they honest? Do they have integrity? Are they accountable? Are they responsible? I can buy this desk, pay a certain amount of money, but I can't buy integrity. I can't buy honesty. And that's what people look for. When you think about this whole election cycle and all the campaigning that's going on, it's always about somebody's integrity. 
somebody's honesty. Who's telling the truth? And then we have to decide. We have to make that awesome decision and vote and make the decisions. Who do we want as our leader? What's the best candidate? So those are tough decisions as you grow up, as you'll find out as you get older. But that's all part of the leadership, right? So when I say live your dreams, I mean, my parents used to ask me when I was a kid, I said, what do, what do you want for uh, Christmas? You know, I said, well, I want a toy police car. Or I want a toy badge. You know, I want a policeman's uniform. Those, those kinds of things, you know, because I'm living my dream. I'm not chasing it. I, I, this is what I'm thinking. And as I got older and I got out of high school, then the draft came up and I decided, well, I have to go in the military. So I decided, you know what, I'll volunteer and I can pick my occupation field in the military. You could do that back then. So I joined the Army and be, became a military policeman. And that was a military policeman. The day I got out of being a military policeman, three years later, I was hired by the state as an undercover drug agent. So I did undercover drug enforcement. And then I got hired by Fort Collins Police Department. Stayed there for another 23 years. And it, Enjoyed my career, retired as a police sergeant. Then it was time to start living my other dream, and that was to become mayor. And then I ran for mayor. And you know what the irony of this is? Is that people will tell you you can't do it. Don't listen to it. Because you can do anything you want. Everything is possible. As long as you have a hope, as long as you have a vision, as long as you have a passion, you can accomplish it. When I decided to run for mayor, people said, Ray, you can't win mayor. You can't win mayor. You know why? Because you're Latino. There's not too many in town, Ray. There's not enough to vote for you. I'm running to be the mayor of the city, not running to be the Latino mayor. I'm running to be the mayor. And I wouldn't accept that. And I was right. People accepted me. And when they accepted me, they voted for me. I got elected three times. That's all I could run, was three times. Then I left office for 10 years. Then I became a city council member. And I did a lot of other things in between that. I had my own radio show for about five years. I did that in Greeley, Colorado. Had my own live talk show host. I worked for another company, doing their public relations work for about another five years. So I had a lot of things going on. I've been, I've wore a lot of hats in my life. But when you think about this leadership, Think about it in the terms that it's not about how many people you lead, but it should be about how many people you serve. See, look for opportunities to serve others. Don't look for opportunities for people to serve you. That's genuine leadership. And having a positive attitude makes a world of difference. There's, there's um, where'd my pen go? There we go. There are what I call four rare things that leaders often forget, okay? So this, this one is called responsibility. Being responsible, being responsible is so important. Being a responsible person. The other one is being accountable. And this one, the next R, is being relational. How do you get along with people? Do you want to get along with people? Or are you just constantly finding wrong with the rest of the world and the world's wrong and you're right? Or are you just, woe is me? Relational is building relationships. It's building bridges. How do you do that? Okay. And the other one is to be an encourager. Do you encourage others? Do people encourage you? When's the last time you told another one of your classmates that you're doing a great job? Yeah. That's the thing to do. Because you know what? When you deliver that message, it comes right back. People start looking at, what a great job you're doing, too. So if we're encouraging each other, we're building each other up, and we will do better. 
You see, if we change the way we look at things, the things we look at will change. So it's incumbent upon us to make that difference. How do we make the difference? When I look at people who influenced me through my, my career, my life growing up, I think of people like Dr. Gil Carbajal. He was a teacher at Lincoln Junior High School. And he was my basketball coach. He's a dynamic guy. And to this day, he and I still stay in touch. And he still coaches me. He still tells me things that I need to know. And I'm, I'm surprised every time we meet, I learn something new from him again. I thought, when does this end? Because he's a lot older than me, and I'm pretty old. So I'm still learning. There's a great saying. This is an old saying. It's by an unknown author. He says, man does not grow old. But when, when man stops growing, he becomes old. Okay? So in other words, we've got to grow all our life. You never stop educating. You never stop learning. You never stop absorbing. You see, power, people like power. Power doesn't come from what we know. Power comes from what we need to learn. That's where it is. So if we're constantly feeding ourselves and growing in knowledge, then planting those kinds of seeds in other people's lives, just like we're doing today. Hopefully I'm planting a seed in somebody's life because planting the seed is more important than anything else. You see, I can take an apple, slice it in half, right? And I can tell you how many seeds are in that apple, right? We can all count them. But what I can tell you is how many apples are in the seed. That's more important. So if I've got that seed, that's essential. Colorado State University has a place where they store in North America every seed that there is. That's how important they are. Because if anything ever happened, if we ever had a catastrophe, we could at least reseed the earth. Isn't that great when you think about that? So how many seeds are you planting? And do you see seeds in your life that people have planted do you have respect for those people that planted that in your life? Developing that is something that you got to identify. It's really important. When I think of people like Coach Al Kennard. He was another one of my mentors that I still visit with today. And he, he's, he's a great mentor because he's still got life lessons. They're endless. They're totally endless. So I, I think of people like Dr. Lupe Salazar. She's at Colorado State University. She made it the hard way. She grew up out of poverty and put herself through school. And as a grandmother, raised some of her grandchildren, but still put herself through school and got her PhD. Dr. Lupe Salazar, great person. She's at Colorado State University. She runs a Latino organization there. Those are people that I look up to. They, these are people that I admire. If I can be around achievers, then I'm going to achieve. Does that make sense, what I'm saying? I mean, these are, these are powerful mechanisms in our life. And, and we learn this. Uh, another key thing is respect. How do we respect each other? There's a great Native American story. It's one of the great ones. And, and it's, a, it's a young Native American grandson talking to his grandfather. And he said, Grandfather, he says, what's more important, to give respect or to receive respect. And his grandfather says, grandson, what's more important, the left wing of an eagle or the right wing? And he caught that moment. All of a sudden, there was a little knowledge there. Because see, you see, in order for the eagle to fly, he's got to fly with both wings, doesn't he? So the left wing has to soar with the right wing. I wish our politicians would learn that that we got to soar together. Does that make sense? So respect is what pulls us together, too, that we respect each other's life and where we came from. It's not all about the sadness in life. We have sad moments. We have rocky roads. That's the way it is. But we also take life lessons from those rocky roads and make sure we can achieve. The first Latino city council member we had was Mr. Willie Lopez. Willie Lopez was uh, one of my teachers at Poudre High School from many years ago. And he's a very honoring, uh, a very respectful man. 
And I remember one time, he had to correct me one time in the hallway. And he told me, he says, Ray, that's not the way we behave. And he said, because as Latinos, we have to set the example for how we want our fellow Latinos to behave and how we want people to perceive us. I was embarrassed when he said that, very embarrassed. He knew my parents. And I thought for sure he's going to tell my parents and I'm going to get in double trouble, you know. But he never did. That was a conversation he and I had in the hallway. And I never forgot that. And that stuck with me all my life. You can see I'm still telling the story from when I was in high school. Because that was a, that was a teachable moment that he taught me something. And I learned right away what respect was and how important it was. And... My dad used to say growing up, he said, Ray, not only do you have to do it right, but you have to do it better. And sometimes that's not good enough. Well, that's a never-ending task, isn't it? So you have to keep trying for the rest of your life. Because what you think you're succeeding in, that's not good enough. You've got to keep going. And you've got to try to sharpen it a little bit. Sharpen the tool a little bit. Make it just a little bit better. You know? The, the, there's a great statement, and I'm sure, I hope I can remember this correctly. Elevation's Credit Union has this uh, line that they, they like to say. He said, you should do better today than you did yesterday, and tomorrow better than you did today. So it's constantly moving forward and not looking back. If you're driving a car and you keep looking in the rearview mirror, you're going to get in a car wreck, Right? You got to keep looking forward. And that's what I want you to do. Because every one of these, all the careers that you're talking about, from doctors to professional sports people to teachers, everything you're talking about here requires leadership. It requires you to be relational. It requires you to be an encourager and accountable and responsible for your profession of what you are. That's all part of it. And it requires you to accept people for who they are and to share what you have and to what? Don't stereotype people. Accept people for who they are. Enjoy life. That's all part of it. Leadership, to me, is tantamount of surrounding yourself with people who are much brighter than you. Because the more people you can hang around with that are brighter, the more you're going to learn. So you have to be a part of that. Let me field some questions. Any questions that you might have? You know, you do work at it, and, it, and it's a mindset. But to me, it was, a, it was a spiritual connection for me. For me, it's a personal growth in my relationship, in my religion, in my faith. That helps me a lot. You know, for others, it may be different. But I, I think staying positive is not something that comes automatically. You have to want to do it. You have to have a desire. So get that into your system first. Did I do what? Did you give up? Like, did you give up at one point during your journey? <laughs> yeah, probably about a hundred times I've given up. You know, you, 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 once you hit this, what you think is rock bottom, that you, you failed and you did something wrong, and then you just like, man, I never want to see another person for the rest of my life. When I talked about the, my teacher friend, Dr. Gil Carbajal, <coughs> he was my basketball coach, right? So I, I rarely got to play basketball, you know, my cousins were on the team and, and finally I, they put me out on the floor because I wasn't that great of a player. I knew that, but I wanted to go play, right? So I went out there and was playing guard and, and then all, they threw the ball at me and I thought, wow, now what I'm going to do, right? So I took off with the ball and I ran down to the basket, dunked it, nice basket, right? And all of a sudden I heard this laughter and I turned around and I looked and my cousins were staring at me. They were just like this, and they were just shaking their head. And then I saw Dr. Carbajal, and he waved his hand at me to come back to the sideline. And I didn't realize it, but I made the basket for the wrong team. So my team was mad at me, right? Understandably, right? And, and you know what Dr. Carbajal told me? You would think he would have said, Ray, that was wrong, right? No. He put his arm around me and said, that's a good basket. You made a good basket. 
he, he was the only guy that was on my side. He was my only friend I had for the day. And I couldn't leave his side because I, I didn't have any other friends for the day. That's for sure. Man, that day, I just thought, I never want to play basketball again. Now, now I didn't go on to be a professional ball player, that's for sure. But it's those kinds of things. It's that positive image that he gave me. He taught me how to be positive. That's what he taught me. On that life lesson, he taught me to stay positive. Good basket, next time we'll just figure out which one's the one you belong at. You know? But first things first, you made a good basket. How long have you been working for? I'm sorry? How long have you been working for? Well, I've been working all my life. <laughs> I've never been out of a job, so I've always been working, but it's always been different things. You know, on city council now, this is my... Uh, this April will be two years. I'll complete two years, so I got another two years to go on city council. But I've been with city government for over 30 years, you know, working with, in that in that department. Um, how did you stay positive when people gave you negativity? Yeah, that's that's a good one because you know at first you you want to become angry. You know what anger is? What is it? I'm going to show you an easy way to learn that. What's anger? What do you think it is? Yeah, that can create anger, right? Sometimes it's just aggravation, and you want to take it out on somebody, or you want to get back, you want to get even. That's not how to deal with it, right? But think about this way. Here's what anger is. All anger is is one letter short of what? Danger. That's what it is. That's what anger is. It's just one letter short of danger. So you have to watch yourself. And, and it's easy to get in conflict with people and to snap back at them because you have this knee-jerk reaction that you want to you know, get even with them because they downplayed you in some way or they cheated you or they lied to you or they took something from you. You want to get angry about it, right? You don't have to. That's a choice. All these things that we talk about like that, these are all choices. You can choose to be happy or you can choose to be unhappy. You know? So what's the choice you want to go? What road do you want to go? What's going to work towards your success of being the doctor? That's what you have to ask yourself. Anyone else? Questions? Um, did you ever arrest anybody when you were a cop? <laughs> Many people. In fact, let, let me tell you about my first arrest that I ever made. I was an undercover drug agent working for the state, and my first arrest was a Denver police sergeant who was in charge of the narcotics unit. He was selling me cocaine and heroin and marijuana. So that was the first arrest I ever made. That made statewide news and all the papers, uh, but that was a pretty big deal. But yes, I've made arrests, but sometimes you've got to clean up in-house first before you can go outside the house and try to nail everybody else. How many years did you go to college? Two years. Two years? Years, yeah. I, went, I got a criminal justice degree at Ames Community College. If you had one wish, what would that wish be? Well, you know, here's the wish that I had. And I said, I, if, if I get this wish, I, I'm satisfied for the rest of my life. And that is, I wanted to find my biological mother because my adopted parents had passed away. And one of the ir ironic things about uh, when my mother passed away, uh, I went through her cedar chest because my dad couldn't handle it very well. He's very emotional. And I went through sorting things out that she kept in there. And there was two things that she kept in there. She kept the, remember the toy dog I was saying? at the orphanage that I got. She kept that. And the first stocking cap that, the, that they gave me, they stuck over my head and carried me out of the orphanage with. I still got those two items today. And every year at Christmas, I put those under the Christmas trees to remind me where I came from. So that was a beautiful thing for me to find. And I couldn't believe that my mother kept it all those years. It was, it was almost like she knew that would be meaningful for me. And it is. 
So it's a good reminder for me. Now I forgot about the original, oh my wish. And, and that was to find my biological mother. Well, it happened. To make a long story short, I went through a search and found my biological mother on November, November 5th in 2005. And I made that phone call to her several times. And she hung up on me. She didn't know what to think. And finally, I called her from a different number, and we had a great conversation. I said, look, Gloria, that was her name. I said, don't hang up on me. I want to share a couple things with you. And if you never want to meet me, I'm OK with it. This has always been my wish that I've been able to find you and tell you this. So I told her two things. One, I said, I want her to her know that life turned out great, that she didn't make a mistake. And I kind of went through a little bit what my life was like and becoming mayor and everything else. And then the second thing I told us, I just want to thank her for giving me life and not taking my life. And she said, well, I'll let you know if I want to get back with you. And she hung up the phone. And I thought, this could be forever. This could be five years, 10 years from now. She called me the next day. And she told me the story of what had happened to her. She was a victim of a very uh, violent incident. And that's how I came to be. And so our bond grew tremendously together. I asked her why she hung up. And one of the things she told me, she said, I was in shock because they told me when I gave you up for adoption, I told them I wanted to hold you one more time. And they told me that you had died. So she thought I was dead all these years. So she didn't know what to think of the phone call. So that mended a lot. And for some reason or another, as a mother's intuition, she felt like I was alive out there somewhere. She didn't know why she thought that. She had no evidence of that. But she just felt like I was. And I always felt the same way. So we had a bond there. We had a connection going on. And we both had a hope that someday we would connect back together. And we did. And then I found four sisters and a brother I never knew I had. And so we've been reunited ever since. We celebrate Christmases, birthdays, Thanksgiving, everything. My sisters have been sending me texts like crazy for the last couple of days. Here's what you should bring for Thanksgiving. I told them I don't cook. You know? <laughs> but we got a great bond, you know? And all those things work together for good. See, all those what we call the bumpy roads turned out to be a great path. So don't knock the failures in your life because those failures are learning curves that's going to propel you up to the next stage. Take advantage of that. Yeah? Any other questions? One more question. I think we're almost out of time. How old were you when you first got into this? I, I was there from when I was born, eight days, till I was five years old. You've been a great class. Good questions. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Remember, stick to your, your as what we say, our ganas. That means, you know, go by what your corazón, your heart says, and, and have the guts to do what's right. And you stick with it, and you, you will be achievers. Every one of you will achieve your profession that you claim that you want it. It will happen. Thank you very much.